I'm Francois Fenter. I'm a clinician working at Fitz University. I'm Deputy Director of the Reproductive Health and HIV Institute at Fitz and I've been involved in the HIV Clinician Society for the last 10 years. I wanted to talk about an area which I think is fast evolving in HIV and which would probably interest most healthcare workers, but particularly those people involved in HIV, which is the issue of HIV post-exposure prophylaxis and just some new things which are coming out. WHO is busy at the moment, as of when we're filming this, which is September 2014, finalizing its final guidelines on post-exposure prophylaxis um, for, the whole of, um, for the whole of the world. The Southern African Clinician Society once were last released in 2008, we're currently updating them and hoping to have them ready by the end of 2014. We are in a situation where the Department of Health guidelines haven't been updated properly um, since early, the early 90s. While there is a internal processes to make sure that there are more up-to-date um, drug regimens available, they haven't been finalized and they haven't been formalized within with the South, certainly within the Southern African, uh, the South African public sector, even in the private sector, people often recom get recommendations which are extremely outdated, even drugs which are not even available anymore. So the stuff that's really changed in the last couple of years is two things. The first thing is, I think we've realised that we're not going to get better evidence than we have. That we have, you're never going to get evidence that two drugs is better than three drugs after a needle stick or after sexual exposure. We're not going to get the kind of good evidence that we want about um, what kind of transmission is arrested. And what's kind of coming out of this is firstly an amalgamation of all transmissions. So we don't, I think we're stopping um, the kind of occupational versus non-occupational dichotomy because um, we recognize in fact that there are sexual exposures which are actually higher risk than even the needle stick. And once you start grouping them all together, the principles are quite simple and they're quite the same. As you kind of say, am I going to give this person ARVs to stop the transmission? Um, what's the monitoring around them and how long do they need to take them? Now, how long they used to take them um, was often a function of how long people were able to tolerate them was a function of the, the tolerability of the drugs. We have such safe drugs now that it's much, much easier than it was. So we don't angst too much anymore about two or three drugs. We tend to use three drugs, right, irrespective of the exposure. The decision point is, are you going to take drugs? If drugs, you're going to take three. In the old days, we'd wring our hands about one or two or three. Now we're just going to go to three. Um, the, the question there is whether we'll be able to, to afford the third drug, which is um, likely to be an integrase inhibitor going forward, um, which has almost no known side effects, particularly in the short term. Um, so the big move there is how can we simplify the drug regimen that we're choosing and how can we get that into the state sector and into the private sector as quickly as possible. Now, my feeling is looking at the pricing and everything else is that the recommendations going forward is likely to be a combination of tenofovir, m or 3 tc and an integrase inhibitor, either Altegravir or the Dolutegravir or any of the others that are coming along the line. And that hopefully will be available both within the state and the private sector in, in, this, in a similar vein um, going forward. So we've simplified the drugs. It also means that we're not going to angst about how long to take them. We're unlikely to ever get a clinical trial that will show once and for all that it's 17 days or 32 days, we're probably going to be stuck with the 28 days going forward. And that's easier to do now that the drugs are so much safer. So those are the two big things which people need to understand is this kind of move forward away from occupational and non-occupational because those are very conflated. You know, a sex worker whose condom bursts is a kind of an occupational exposure. While somebody gets bitten um, on the side of the road by a trauma victim, who's doing a resuscitation, who's a medical student, who's also, whether that's occupational, non-occupational, who knows? It doesn't really matter. The exposure is the exposure, and you want to protect somebody from getting from HIV. So those two things, safer drugs, easier regimens, coupled with this recognition that your decision point is, do you want to take drugs or don't you? And that's why post-exposure prophylaxis, I think, going forward, is going to be a lot simpler than it was in the past.